tonight we are diving yet again back into Genesis chapter 1. Tonight we're going to be in a single verse, verse 26. And before I get started, I want to point you to a quote from John Piper that I think that just really puts the nail, the hammer on the nail on the head, really extremely threads the needle on what this verse means for us. The title of tonight's sermon is Man Created in His Image. <clears throat> the proper understanding of everything in life begins with God. No one will ever understand the necessity of conversion who does not know why God created us. He created us in His image so that we would image forth His glory in the world. We were made to be prisms refracting the light of God's glory into all of life. Why God should want to give us a share in shining with His glory is a great, great mystery. Call it grace or mercy or love. It is an unspeakable wonder. Once we are not, then we existed for the glory of God. The context of tonight's sermon is we are continuing to walk through the creation account. and We find ourselves here on the sixth day of creation. Just for a slight flyover, flyby view of 30,000 foot, let's look at the context of where we are at so we can better understand where we are in verse 26. Thus far in Genesis, we've spent the vast majority of our time understanding, figuring out, and properly applying creation through the scope of or the lens, if you will, of how it pertains to man's maintenance. We've seen the triunity of creation, how formless and void the earth was at its dawn. We've read and dissected the creation of light and how creation is done through the work in the person of Jesus Christ. We've seen the separation of darkness and light, of the waters and of the seas and the dry ground. Christ created vegetation. He created fruit trees. He created green grass. He created the greater and the lesser lights, the sun, the moon, and also the stars. Christ created creatures such as fish, whale, mollusks, jellyfish, blue jays, crows, chickens, and even emus. He created lions and tigers and bears. He created cattle, centipedes, spiders, and elephants. He created all of it. He created all of these things, and he created it for man's, man's maintenance, but mostly for his glory. Tonight, our theme verse brings us here to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let's read that together now. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness so that they will have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all of the earth and every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I would like to pray before we dive in tonight. Please join me in doing so. Heavenly Father, tonight we are considering heavy things, things that are very important for our understanding of what it looks like and is to be made in your image, to be made in the image of the Godhead. Father, help us grasp these, these topics. Help us grasp these truths and apply them to our lives so that we can better magnify and reflect your glory to you. Father, thank you so much for creating us. Thank you most for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Before we get into the doctrine, I want to take a look at the general exposition of these verses so we have a very good understanding of what this is actually saying to us before we try to see the doctrine that we want to apply through it. So first off, at the very beginning, it says, Then God said, and we know from our past experiences that that is a, an iteration of Christ creating. God's speech, God's words, that is Christ then we come to something that's unfamiliar to us. We, we haven't seen this yet in the creation account. We come to let us. Let us. Now, see the plurality here. What does that plurality mean? Well, it means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
It is the whole Godhead here creating. Let us. It is not let me. It is not I will. It is let us. Meaning it's the plurality of the Godhead here at work. Then we have our next couple of words and comes with make man. This is a new creature. This isn't something that God has created before. This is not fish. This is not elephant. This is not mollusks. This is not grass. This is not fruit tree. This is make man. Man is new. This is the starting up of the origination. This is the dawn of man here that God's making. We now have, we come to, after make man, we come to our image. Now, what do we, what do we think when we hear those words, our, our image? We know that the Godhead is creating here, so... The God is creating in our image. What, is, what does that mean? We see the plurality. It's, it's a doubling down of sorts. The words our image dictate that the creation of man and what is contained in man is representative of the members of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We next come to according to. Now, according to here means in relation to or pr proportional to or in step with, or in obedience with. So we have God said, let us, the Godhead, make man, new creature, in our image, which means that what man consists of reflects and is at least pieces of what God, the Godhead is, according to. Now we have according to, what is it according to? Our likeness. We have our likeness here. This is emphatic in the Hebrew. You'll see Moses use the same type of literary device just in the next verse. He says, in our own image, in the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. He doubles down again in that verse. So this is a lot of sandwiches of doubling down, if you will, by Moses. This literary device is emphatic in the Hebrew. It's, it's a saying of the same words, just slightly different ways. So make sure that you understand it's really in their image. It's really in likeness. <clears throat> He's communicating to us that not the image and likeness are different, but they're the same thing. <clears throat> so that if you've been around reform preaching at all, a lot of a lot of folks like to say what is the therefore therefore. We can kind of take that same approach with the so that. We have everything that's in the first part of verse 26 here building up to the so that. Everything that the, the why and the how and everything that God is creating so far in the image, in our image, in, their, in our likeness, so in the image of the Godhead and the likeness of the Godhead is so that, that's the because of all of these previous dealings. So that God has established man will have dominion over all. So we have the so that, we have the dominion right next to each other. And then what do we have dominion over? Well, he names everything that he's created so far. So he's created on the sixth day this superior creature, the superior creation. And in that superior creation, we have the likeness and image of God. <clears throat> so the doctrine that we can really glean from this tonight is that the triune God made man in his own image, perfectly establishing man's soul as the imprint of the likeness of of God. And I'll say that one more time. The triune God made man in his own image, perfectly establishing man's soul as the imprint of the likeness to God. Now, before we get started, I want to be completely transparent and let all of you know that tonight's sermon will be focusing much on the first half of verse 26. The dominion piece of this verse, we will get to in two more sermons in Genesis, in verse 28. But tonight I really wanted to focus and hone in on, on what this means to be created in God's image and in God's likeness. So my first point tonight, my only point, is that the triune God created man in his image. I want to ask you two questions to think through what all is preached tonight. I want you to use these two questions to audit the things preached tonight and, and to view them through these specific reasons and these specific thoughts. Why is it important that we are created in God's image? 
And where does our likeness to God in his image rest at in man? <clears throat> I really want you to take in something important here from the text. This is the first time that God has uttered, let us, in all of creation. In the prior five days of creation, God has said, let there be, and there was. This is the first time, let us, has came about. Children, and with whom do you think God consulted? Well, of course, he consulted with the other members of the Godhead, the Son and the Holy Spirit. You might be saying, Pastor, what does this really actually mean for us? What does this mean for me? It means that God deliberated when he thought of man. Now, I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying either. God didn't have to think about creating man. God didn't have to consult other, piece, other parts of the Godhead to make sure that he was doing it right. right? That's not what we're saying here. We're saying that this is intentional. We're saying that this is deliberate. We're saying that this is very carefully thought out and thought for. This is God showing his ever care and his ever love for us. We have no other deliberation in any previous creation. We have no deliberation in the fiery star in the sky that we call the sun that is magnet. It's, it's, it's huge to us. We can't even think about how big the sun is. We have no deliberation in God creating the inner workings of every living thing on this planet. There's no deliberation there. He's, he's spoken it was. God said, let us. There was, there's deliberateness in that. There is intentionality in that. This is him showing his love for us more than we can really probably fathom or understand. John Calvin, when preaching this very text, says, Although the sun and the moon are such noble creatures that they appear to be divine. Although the heavens also have an appearance which astonishes and delights men. Although the great diversity of fruits and other things that we see here on earth are designed to declare unto us a divine majesty. The fact remains that if we compare all of that with man, we will find in man much grander and more exquisite features. Children, do you know what a soul is? And I'm not talking about the soles of your feet or of your tennis shoes, but the soul that resides inside you. The soul of a man is the internal part of our bodies. A cow has a heart, so do we. A pig has eyes, so do we. Frogs live and breathe, so do we. But no other animal has a soul. Not one. Nobody, nothing has ever been created that God has cared for so much. Only people have souls, and only God cares about people in the estate more than the animals. He cares about you. It is intentional that you are here. I want to now unpack what and where this likeness of God rests inside of us. You'll remember that question I asked you at the beginning of the sermon. Let us first consider our body. I just spoke to the children, but adults, do we see it in Scripture that we are like God because of our physical body and its components, because of how grand our mind is, or how creative that we may be, or how wonderful physical strengths that we have can prop us up? Well, let's let Scripture be the final arbiter. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Luke 24, 39 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation? 1 Timothy 1, 17 says, Now to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Kings 8, 27 says, But will God truly dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. 
with the help of all of these verses and many, many more riddled through the pages of Scripture, we can see very evidently that we do not resemble God in our physical selves, our physical traits, and what we can do physically. Calvin's sermon again on this verse points us to this truth. Consequently, neither the hair or the eyes, the feet nor the hands will lead us to where Moses is guiding us. As far as the superiority and the preeminence which have been given to man above all creatures, those human features do not create, convey the image of God. For those are external features and will not lead us very high. And yet for all of that, we must come to the soul, which is the most worthy and precious part of man. Although God has displayed the great tre treasures of his power, goodness, and wisdom in forming us, Yet the soul has reason, understanding, and will, which is more than anything to be found in this external body. Now, not that we don't trust John Calvin, but let's go to the scriptures again to make sure of this truth. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says, So also it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Hebrews 6.19 says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and confirmed, and one which enters within the veil. Psalm 33, 18 and 19. Behold, the eye of Yahweh is on those who fear him, on those who wait for his loving kindness, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine psalm 103 1 says bless yahweh O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless yahweh O my soul ezekiel 18 4 says behold all souls are mine the soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine the soul who sins will die. We see here that it is the very fabric of man that lives as in the soul. <clears throat> our souls are what is delivered from death. Not our bodies. Not our hands and fingers. Our souls deliver from death. We worship with our soul. And it's very evident, Ezekiel 18.4 says that all souls are God's. The 1689 Confession of Faith, chapter 4, paragraph 2, sums up well the idea that we're really diving into here. After God had made all other creatures, he created man, male and female, with reasonable and immortal souls, rendering them fit unto that life to God for which they were created, being made after the image of God, in knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness, having the law of God written on their hearts and the power to fulfill it, yet under a possibility of transgressing, being left to the liberty of their own will, which was subject to change. The evidence of man's soul being the perfectly created reflection of God exists through the annals of Scripture in copious display. It's inarguable. It's, a, it's placed as a supreme mirror to reflect the holy glory of God is irrefutable. Nothing that you do, raising your hands when you sing, lifting your voice loud, preaching the word, none of it, not one part of it, is you, your body, giving glory to God. It's your soul. Your soul is what worships the Lord. This perfectly created mirror, this prism as John Piper puts it, the supreme reflection has been shattered though through the fall. We are fallen men and women. We have a father in Adam that fell and we are his and so we are fallen because of that. We would do the exact same thing if we were Adam or we were Eve, we, we, would, we would sin in the same ways. 
So our soul isn't this perfect prism or this perfect mirror anymore. It's shattered and broken. And unless we are reconciled to God, the repair of that prism or mirror is never touched. It's left broken and shattered. It's left in tattered pieces. It's left to its own devices, not being capable of doing anything but shining glory within. The most important entity of your living, breathing carcass isn't your brain or your heart or your lungs. It's your soul. I'm going to say that one more time. The most important piece of your living, breathing body is not your brain. It is not your heart. It is not your lungs. It is your soul. Your brain and your heart and your lungs don't go to hell. They don't go to heaven. Your soul does. That is what's redeemed. Sin consumes this broken prison. This broken mirror that's inside of us before we are reconciled, it consumes it like a wildfire would consume a box of matches within seconds. Only stoking your further ruin. Oh, but Christ. Oh, but Christ. Saint, can't you remember the living water's first extinguishing of this wildfire within you? Can't you remember the first time that those flames were quenched and you felt repair and you felt that you could glorify something other than yourself willingly and desiring to do it? For any of you today that that don't know this wonderful extinguishing of those flames. Can't you feel the heat growing inside of you? Can't you feel the temperature rising? Can't you feel like you're surrounded? There's no way out. Your sin is ravaging you like a wildfire ravages a dry hillside quickly with very high heat with no escape repent today repent today and be extinguished repent today and have the living water drench your soul so that you may be redeemed it's a puritan by the name of Thomas Gadiger once said, The soul of man bears the image of God, so nothing can satisfy it but he whose image it bears. Our soul, says Augustine, was created as by God, so for God, and there's therefore never quiet till it rests in God. Saints, you have rest, don't you? You know that rest. You can feel that rest. Although it's not perfect today. But you have some semblance of that. You have some knowing of that rest that Christ has you. He's reconciled you. If you're yet to be reconciled, if you are dead in your trespasses, your soul is never going to rest forever. Hell is very real, and it is very restless. And the sin that you have that engulfs you right now doesn't hold a candle to hell itself. Now, what do we do with this? What do we do with this revelation? Ephesians 4, 20-24 tells us this. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you heard him and were taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, to lay aside in reference to your former conduct, the old man, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and to be renewed 
in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new man, which in the likeness of God has created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Colossians 3, 1 through 11 says also, Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not the things that are on this earth. For you died and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is who our life is manifested, then you also will be manifested with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead, as dead, to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked, when you were living in them. But now you also lay them all aside, wrath, Anger, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you put off the old man with its evil practices, and have put on the new man which is being renewed to a full knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian Scythian, slave, and freeman. But Christ is all and all. These two verses speak of a theme that we must understand. When you are reconciled to God, you're renewed. Before the fall of man, our souls were created in such a disposition that they were perfect in the way that they worked. They were perfect in their reflecting of glory. They were perfect in giving God all of the glory. They were perfect in not sinless, right? After the fall, these are shattered. When you're reconciled to Christ, those souls become mended. Those souls become, as it were, being closer and closer and closer to what God has created and deemed perfect. What must we do? We must turn our souls over to God. It is He who they thirst after. It is He who can mend the shattered glass to perfect mirror once more. It is only He who might save you, sinner, from your sin. It is only He. An application denied, I have six uses. Use one. Take care of your soul. Saints, fill it with holy things. With prayer, supplication, with songs and hymns and psalms. Fill it with intimate knowledge of the person who created you, God. Fill it with knowledge of holiness. Do these things that you might fulfill Christ's foremost commandment in Mark 12, 30. And you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Fill your soul with things that are good and are holy. Take care of your soul. Secondly, bless the Lord with your soul. We see this language riddled throughout the Psalms and other places in the Scriptures as well, but throughout the Psalms, we see many times... Bless you, O Yahweh. O my soul, bless you. Thank God for your soul. Thank God for your disposition. You were created with a soul. The beasts of the field and the creatures of the ground, the fish of the sea, were not. It is this soul that enables us, upon reconciliation, to aspire to holiness, to feel God's love. Our ability to have communion with Him rests within our soul. If you're not reconciled to God, you can pray all you want to. You can sing every psalm in the book frontwards and backwards. You can tithe. 
every time the doors of the church are open and you can serve in various ways, but you will not have communion with the one true God. Yeah. You won't. That's not how it works. That's not how he's designed it. He's designed communion with him to be had through your soul. Use three, specifically for the unrepentant. Do not forfeit your soul. What profit do you have by gaining the world and forfeiting your soul? Let them have the world. Let them have all of the silliness that the world is. And give your soul to Jesus. Use four. Specifically to the sleepy Christians. Audit your soul. As you sit here for only a few more moments tonight, I want you to ask yourself, where exactly is my soul headed? If I were to die on the way home, what is my soul filled with? Is it budding with praise to my creator? Is it filled to the brim with brimstone, lapping at the flames that engulf me? What is your soul filled with? It is a rebuilt, imperfect yet, but a rebuilt mirror? Or are the shards of glass stoking the flames inside you? Use five. Revive your soul. Take God's law and apply it to your life, to your soul. His perfect law revived the soul in how it's supposed to operate. The more that we follow the commands of Scripture, the more we adhere to what God says to us, the more that we understand and apply this to us, the more that we live to holiness, the more repaired we become. The more we understand this perfect soul, the more we can see, the more we want to cut our sin away, the more that we desire to live a life unto our Creator, unto holiness, it's by looking at His commandments and looking at His law and fulfilling those things. That's how we have this rebuilt mirror. Our sanctification is little by little by little taking back the soul's original disposition. One that reflects perfect holiness to a perfect creator. And finally, you six. Cleanse your soul. Everything that we have hanging out inside of us that lives rent free inside of our soul that isn't godly, take the garbage out. Throw it in the trash. Live a life unto holiness. Cut away the sin that you think that you're struggling with you're not struggling with it it's your pet sin you love it you don't want to kill it all of you must be swept out all of it all of you must be purged all of you must be removed make that your ambition certainly we are not going to achieve this perfect purging or this perfect cleansing this side of eternity but the work must be done Christian put your hand to the plow think on that sweetness though that honeycomb that on the other side of eternity we get to fully taste the disposition that God created us to be in we will have perfect obedience. We will have perfect desire. We will have perfect holiness. We aren't going to want to sin ever again. Let that be your prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, a people with souls that are shards of glass that only you can repair. 
partial mirrors that we're trying to build piece by piece with sanctification unto you, to live holier lives unto you. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here who has yet to have their soul repaired and to made to where it will reflect your glory, Father, show them their sin. Show them the flames that engulf them. Show them that disposition that is heinous, that's full of iniquity. Father, I pray that you use this text tonight, the working of your Holy Spirit, to convict us, to make us desire to live lives holier unto you, that we may one day taste that sweet, sweet disposition of never sinning again. Father, I love you. I'm thankful for you. I'm most thankful for your son who hung on a cross and bled and died for me. It's in his name I pray. Amen.